Today's podcast is sponsored by the Christ for Disciples podcast. I'm Pastor Paul Steinberg, son of a Ken and father of five sons. Each weekday on the Christ for Disciples podcast, I apply God's word to raising the next generation. Take 10 minutes each weekday to listen to the Christ for Disciples podcast and get direction and gospel power to disciple the youngest generation. Subscribe to the Christ for Disciples podcast by going to ChristForDisciples.com or searching on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and whatever else. ChristForDisciples.com. Saturday morning coffee. You are listening to the Gird Up Podcast. The call to gird up is an ancient way of telling a man to prepare himself for hard work or a battle ahead. Our work is to reclaim masculinity in the modern world. Here, you will find a community of believers working hard to become the men that God has created us to be. We're glad you've joined us today. Now it's time to roll up your sleeves, to gird up, and join us on this road towards Christian manhood. May God bless your time with us. Here we go. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I am tired. I am weak, I am worn Through the storm, through the night Lead me on to the light Take my hand, precious Lord Lead me home When my day grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is almost gone. At the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Saturday morning might be one of my favorite days, it probably is. There are a few days like Saturday morning because you finally get some stillness, right? And a good Saturday morning, there's few things like it, especially if the sun is shining. It's a little bit crisp and chilly. You got that warm cup of coffee in your hands. Step outside on the front porch, take a deep breath. You feel the Lord, right? You feel the Lord smiling on you. You can feel the Lord's loving embrace. There are few things more powerful than that. There's few things that make me feel more safe and secure in the Lord's hands than that. Um, but there's also the reality that you don't get that feeling. You don't feel that relief. You don't feel that burden lifted. If there wasn't a burden you were carrying in the week before, right? The tougher our weeks are, um, the tougher our weeks are. In particular, the harder we fight, right? The more faithfully we walk with the Lord during the week. And the heavier the burden is while we walk faithfully with the Lord, the greater our relief is on Saturday morning. I like to think about um, in college, there was a, my senior year, um, we had a game against Carol, not, uh, against Crown University, and uh, they kicked our butts. 
the beginning of the game to the end of the game, they kicked our butts. I don't remember. They put up like 46 points on us. They ran all over us. Um, but we gave absolutely everything we had to that game. From the first w- play to the final whistle, we gave absolutely everything we had. And I just remember um, they had a very, very, very good offensive line. And uh, we had a pretty decent defensive line. Uh, but I just remember... Like, I, I played every single snap on defense of the entire game. I just remember, like, middle of the third quarter, thinking to myself, I know we've been beaten. I know <laughs> that we're out of this, that we're probably not going to win. We had a very, 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 very small chance of winning the fight. Um, but just hurling my body back into the fray over and over and over again. And knowing that my brothers were doing the same thing, because we were having conversations about it, stay in a fight, stay in a fight, stay in a fight, don't give up, stay in a fight. And then at the point at which we knew we weren't going to win, we kept having that conversation, stay in a fight. This is, this is now beyond football, this is character. Right? We might not win, but there's a legacy we're going to leave. We might not win, but now our honor's at stake. Our character's at stake. We're going to stay in the fight to the end. And the 11 guys on defense stayed in the fight to the bitter end. And I remember getting home, getting off the bus, and crawling upstairs, like literally. I lived on a second floor, but you had to go up three flights of stairs to get there. I remember walking up the first flight of stairs. I remember kind of stumbling up the second flight of stairs. I remember putting my hands on the stairs to help me walk up the third flight of stairs to get to our room. And I uh, tried to get into my bunk bed. I slept on a top bunk, tried to get into my bunk bed. I couldn't do it. So I pulled out the futon, slept on a futon. I remember crashing there. Um, This is probably 11 o'clock at night, crashing there. Didn't even turn the TV on, just crashed. Immediately went to sleep. Woke up at about 10 o'clock the next morning and literally crawled to the bathroom we hadn't been doing any drinking we hadn't been doing any partying it just been that rough of a football game and we had fought that hard that our bodies were gone and I was not the only one who had the experience that day and I look back on it with such an extreme and exhilarating sense of joy and accomplishment because it shows just how much heart we had how much we have in the tank how much i have in the tank and how much strength i can fight with it proved to me that day proved something to me about myself and about my character something i have not forgotten something i wasn't sure i had but proved that day that i had and i've had many conversations with my teammates and my brothers about that game and about that day and about the day afterwards, and we've all expressed the same thing, that it was a fight we were glad to be in, and even though it was a losing effort, what great joy to do it together, what great joy to lay everything on the line for my brothers in arms. It was glorious. It was glorious. I love it. But that feeling of the next day, that memory, that joy that comes in the morning, cannot be experienced if you were not fighting a battle. I think it's really easy for us to uh, forget about that side of this, this picture, right? We, we talk about walking with the Lord, we talk about following the Lord, and we talk about the blessings that will come to us if we do follow the Lord. And that's true. The Lord promises that he will give us the fruits of the Spirit. He promises to release us from guilt and from shame. He promises to sanctify us. He promises to, to help us walk with him. And, and good things are going to happen if I walk with the Lord. Um, that's not to say, you know, I'm not, ta- not talking about some, you know, prosperity gospel. I'm not saying that. But the Lord promises that there are going to be fruits of our righteousness. Um, there's a reason he wants us to walk with him. And it's, it's not just for our salvation. It's because he wants to give us those good gifts. If, 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 a, if a good earthly father, even a terrible earthly father, gives good gifts, right? And even more so a heavenly father. He wants to know us and to love us. We've talked about that before. But we forget about the other side of the coin, that we are in a fight. We are in a spiritual battle. And if we're doing it right, we're going to bear the scars of a spiritual battle. We forget. 
One of my favorite pieces of scripture um, comes from Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus is talking about John the Baptist and himself. And, you know, people had been early in Jesus' ministry, he's talking about, um, people were asking Jesus about uh, who was John, and was John Elijah? Was he the second Elijah? Um, Was John the Savior? If Jesus is the Messiah, as he's claimed to be, then who was John? Um, Who was the Messiah? Who Who was Jesus? Who was John? Where do they fit into the picture? Is Jesus just a teacher who's talking about John, like, what's going on? There was a lot of confusion amongst the Jews. And they consistently asked Jesus about this. And so Jesus talks and is starting to explain who John the Baptist is, that he was preparing the way for the Messiah, that he had begun this battle now, this New Testament battle. Because before John, John is like the last wave of the Old Testament covenant, right? Where they're sacrificing animals, they're daily atoning for sin. This is before Christ is wed to the church, right? This is before... Um, we get this awesome like bride. Christ is the church is or the church is a Christ bride. Um, there's this loving relationship between the two because we've already been redeemed. We've already been uh, restored. Christ has already bought us back. The Father has already restored us in the kingdom because of Jesus' sacrifice. So there's now a shift, right? And Jesus says the following: I tell you the truth, among these those born of women. There has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the greatest of the prophets. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven, like he who is most humble, he is the lowest in the kingdom of heaven, this new covenant, is greater than John the Baptist. For from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. And depending on the translation, they use different words for forceful. They might use violent. uh, They might use rough. Um, They use different words depending on the translation. I kind of like forceful um, because it doesn't, you know, it's really easy to misinterpret violence or rough, right? Um, We're not talking about, you know, like men who use coarse language. Like like, it paints a different picture. So I I like the word forceful, but I think that the other words paint a complete picture too. This idea that these are not, weak men. These are not gentle and kind and nice men. They're gentle, kind warriors. They're tender warriors, as we've talked about before. These are great men. These are mighty men of God. And, and, and that's important to remember, that I, having humbled myself and dying to the world, and having been reborn in the Spirit and walking fully in the light, right? this is not a message for for faint-hearted men. This is not a message for lukewarm men. This is not a message for weekend Christians. This is a message for men who walk with the Lord on a daily basis. I, having humbled myself and dying to the world, having been reborn in the Spirit and fully, completely walking in the light, I am a mighty man of God, a great warrior in a battle for the kingdom of heaven. And that, being a great man of God, being a man who's walking the light, being a great warrior in the battle for the kingdom of heaven, makes me a target of the devil. The devil wants to take me out of the fight. Make no mistake, the devil wants to take me and you out of the fight. And he knows that he's not going to do that in a single moment of disappointment. He knows that we're going to be more resilient than that. He knows that it's not going to be one shot and he's going to take us out. He knows that if he's going to take us out, it's going to be slowly over time. It's going to be small manipulations. It's going to be consistent building uh, frustrations. It's going to be um, small battles that the devil wins over and over and over and over again that build up to eventually defeat us. He's not going to take us out of the fight in a single moment of glory. He's going to take us out of the fight by wearing us down and wearing us out. That's his, that's his goal. That's his job, is to take us out one small victory at a time. And that's exactly how he's going to approach you and I who are walking with the Lord. We've got to understand that this is a battle. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. This is a battlefield. Lukewarm men don't advance the gospel. There's no such thing as an uncommitted warrior. Like a guy that really doesn't want to fight isn't a warrior, right? He's just cannon fodder. There's no such thing as a lukewarm warrior. There's no such thing as an uncommitted warrior. 
This is a battlefield. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is fighting inch by inch, step by step, yard by yard, to take back the ground that the evil one is holding and hold it for the kingdom of heaven. The devil is holding ground. He is holding hearts. He is holding souls. And we, with the Lord, guided by the Lord, led by the Lord, empowered by the Lord, strengthened by the Lord, in the Lord, are fighting to take back the ground that the devil holds. And if we see this as a battle, if we view this as a battle, if we look at it as a battle to take back the kingdom of heaven, a spiritual battle to take back the kingdom of heaven, not a physical one, a spiritual battle to take back the kingdom of heaven, I think that paints a wildly different picture of what we usually think of as our spiritual lives. I think it's really easy to paint this picture in our minds of our spiritual lives being just me and the Lord and me just trying not to wreck it, trying not to ruin it, right? Me just trying to, like, be good. And that's, that's not it at all. The devil and the world and my sinful flesh are actively trying to take me out. They are actively trying to wear me down, to defeat me, to put me in the grave, physically and spiritually. I am a trophy that he wants to win. He's going to fight tooth and nail to the death to take me with him. Right? Uh, Think about the think about the Allied advance in the Pacific in World War II. If you've ever done any reading, if you've ever watched the the HBO series The Pacific, if you've ever watched the old films of the battles in the Pacific, these men had to literally fight for every inch of every rock that they were on. And sometimes it was literally just a big rock. And they had to fight with their lives for every single rock that they took. The spiritual battle that we are locked in is the same way. The devil is holding ground, and he does not want to give it up. But the third thing we need to remember is that this war is already won. This war is already won. Jesus has already been our substitute. Jesus has already won victory. The Lord has already conquered. He already holds the field. He's already won the war, but the battle is not over. Right? Uh, there's still a battle going on. And, and because there's still a battle going on, things are going to go wrong. Um, things aren't going to go right all the time. Strong men stumble and fall. Right? The devil wants to hold his ground. He does not want to yield it, and he's not going to yield it willingly. So we don't fight any longer for our own freedom. We don't fight any longer um, for victory over death and the devil. That has already been conquered. That has already been won. That's not our battle. Our battle is for the souls that the devil is going to take out on his way out, right? Imagine a fleeing army, right? And they're trying to they're trying to do as much damage and destruction while they flee as they possibly can. They have not surrendered. They have been defeated. And so on the way back to their own dominion, on the way back to the pit, on the way back to the, the hell that they're going to spend eternity in, they are doing as much damage as they can on the way. They're doing as much damage as they can on the way. So our job is no longer to try and win the war. Christ has done that. Praise God. Our job is to rescue as many souls as we can as, he, as we route him. Right? As he as he leaves. Christ has already won the war. The devil is in retreat, but he's going to do as much destruction as he can on the way out. And that's where we come in. That's the spiritual battle we fight every single day. That's what our job is as modern Christians, as members of the new covenant. Our job is to continually fight for the ones who are lost and to keep the ones who are found. That's our battle. That's our fight. And because that's our battle and that's our fight, we need to recognize that the devil, if he's going to take as many people down as he can, he needs us out of the way. He needs the lions and wolves out of the way so that he can do that damage. Uh, and so in my particular case, right, I am consistently teaching the word of God to young men and women in the hood who don't hear the word of God, who otherwise won't be taught, who otherwise won't be preached to, right? And 
he would love to absolutely destroy all the work that I'm doing. He would love to absolutely take me out. Right? Think about the pastor in your congregation. What's his job? His job is to shepherd all of you nearer to your heavenly home, to bring you along streams of living water, to lead you in green pastures. That's his job. The devil wants to take him out. Your job. As a man of God, are you leading your family faithfully? Are you leading your family closer to their heavenly home? Are you fighting those spiritual battles? Are you making sure that your children grow up in the word? Are you ensuring that their spiritual welfare is taken care of and and looked after? Are you praying consistently that they stay in the word, that they know you and love you and walk with you all the days of their life? Are you actively working to shepherd the men around you, to work with the men around you, and to yourself and as your family draw closer to your Lord? If you are, you're going to experience hardship. If you are, you need to understand that you are in a battle. And as you are in a battle, you need to understand that you're going to get beat up and you're going to get run over (laughs) at times. Things are going to go wrong. The Apostle Paul talks about the idea that... um, I do not do the good I want to do. The wicked, I do not want to do. The evil, I do not want to do. These are the things I keep on doing. And he even talks about it's not even me anymore that's doing the sin. It's the old man in me. It's the old man in me that Luther tells me I should drown every day in sorrow and contrition. I don't want to do the wicked things I do. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fall away. I do not want to wander. So I fix my eyes on Jesus and I walk in him. And I understand that when tough times come, when I get beat up, when I get weighed down, man, give it to the Lord. Find some quiet time with the Lord. Be restored. Be nourished. Drink deeply from the Lord. Drink deeply from the Word of God. And get back in the fight. Get back in the fight. One of my favorite pieces of Scripture comes from uh, Psalm 47. We sang a song uh, based on Psalm 47 in college that I absolutely loved because you could feel and hear um, the stillness of the Lord. You could see the great mighty works of the Lord right? as we were singing it. Um, but the words, the words of this psalm are absolutely vital in our walk with the Lord because it paints a picture of who the Lord really, truly is. And if we know the Lord as he's described in Psalm 46, I'm sorry, it's not Psalm 47, it's Psalm 46. If we know the Lord as we see him in Psalm 47, he's the one we want to follow. He's the one we want to walk with. He's the one we want to give ourselves completely over to. And the Lord will bless us. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she shall not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Gentlemen, you need to understand that you're in a spiritual battle. You need to identify yourself as a mighty man of God, a great warrior in the kingdom, a great warrior for the battle, for the kingdom of heaven. You need to recognize that your duty as a man of God is to rescue lost souls and is to shield and strengthen the, lost so- the found souls that you have within reach. When you walk with the Lord, when you give yourself completely over to the Lord, when you lose yourself in the Lord and find your identity in Him, when you die to the world and you are born again in the Spirit, the devil paints a target on your back. And he wants to take you out. He wants to take you down. Find 
refreshing, find renewal, find peace in the Lord. Find strength in the Lord. Look to the Lord to fulfill your need. Look for the Lord for renewal and strength. Walk with him, and he will do all these things for you. A mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. He helps us free from every need that has us now or taken. The old evil foe now means deadly woe. Deep guile and great mire, his arms in fight. On earth is not his equal. With might of ours cannot be done. Soon war our loss affected. But for us fights the valiant one, whom God himself elected. You ask, who is this? Jesus Christ it is. The almighty Lord. And there's no other God. He holds the field forever. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will, he can harm us none. He's judged, the deed is done, one little word can fail him. The word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit. Do what they will, hate, steal, hurt, or kill, the wall may be gone, Our victory is won. The kingdom's ours forever. Walk with the Lord, gentlemen. You are a mighty man of God. Walk with the Lord. Fight for the Lord. And trust that he'll bring you home. And trust that he will give you everything you need. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Gird Up Podcast. If you like what you're hearing on our podcast, make sure you're sharing it with friends and family, men in your life who you think need to hear our message. You can find us on social media, on Facebook under the Gird Up Podcast, and there's a Gird Up community as well there where you can interact with other men on the journey toward Christian manhood. You can find us on Instagram as Gird Up underscore like underscore a underscore man. If you'd like to help us bring our message to more men just like you all around the world, you can hit up our Patreon account. Type in www.patreon.com forward slash Gird Up. And finally, please leave a five-star rating or review on whatever platform you use to listen to our podcast, whether it's iTunes or Spotify. What that does is it helps us get more attention in the podcast world and bring more men to our message. Thank you again for listening to our podcast. Thank you for all the ways you support us and help spread the word. Until next time, go gird up and be the man that God created you to be.